Well, this is an update to the CW Flea project. Um, I spent the last week, plus a couple of days, really nose deep in the project, doing quite a bit of work. Um, first off, I want to make sure I'm clear on, on one thing. This is an open source project. I'm going to publish everything. I'm going to publish the schematic, the design, the software, everything. Put it out there as a, as a base project. And uh, you're absolutely free then to take it and, and expand upon it as you wish, um, as people have done with my projects in the past. I, I occasionally get uh, emails from people that have built something like my Duino Vox and added a display to it or added other functionality to it. And I, I get really jazzed about that. You know, I, I love open source and I love it for that reason. Uh, it allows people to get started on something that's more elaborate with something that's simple, you know, as a building block. So it will be completely open source. Uh, so um, what have I done so far this week? Well, quite a bit. I have uh, finished the schematic. I've uh, done most of the blog write-up, um, technical write-up on it. Uh, I have uh, got the software to a working state, which is a big part of it. I needed to get the software done. I needed to get the schematic and the software done so I could get those over to Harry at Zach Tech so he could start working on his prototype too. Because as I've mentioned before, uh, Zach Tech will be producing a product of ready-to-air, uh, completely built and ready-to-go version of this that you can just purchase from them if you want, if you don't want to build it. So that's, uh, that's going to be uh, pretty cool. Um, anyway, uh, let's talk about specs. Uh, there was uh, at least one person over on Patreon, Patreon that seemed disappointed, maybe, or at least... Uh, unaware that this is a very low power transmitter. This is a QRP P, that second P being lowercase, uh, transmitter. It's low power. Um, it's probably going to put out somewhere around 400 to 500 milliwatts uh, as, as it's spec'd out. Now that's not to say that it's limited to that. Um, somebody could simply replace or add a uh, another amplifier stage like an IRF 510 power MOSFET and probably take it up to four or five watts out if they wanted to. As I said, it's an open design so people can extend it however they want. Uh, but uh, a simple low power transmitter, you know, this is something like the, well, the Pixie's a transceiver, um, but, you know, it's along those lines like the Pixie or the Mighty Mite or, you know, any of those simple low power transmitters. That's the class this is in. So um, let's get that out there. So yeah, around four to 500 milliwatts output, which for CW, um, you can make a lot of contacts with. You know, it's, you're not gonna bust a pile up, but you can definitely get on the air and make contacts with. Uh, so yeah, um, bands. I'm building my prototype for 20 meters, but the only thing you have to change to put it on a different band is the low pass filter and uh, three variables that you change the value of in the software uh, to move it to a different band. So it's, it, you could build it for any band you want. If you want to build it for 80 meters, build it for 80 meters. You know, it's, 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 um, that's totally flexible. We'll talk about that a bit more in detail when, we, when we're looking at the schematic here in a moment. So, uh, I, I, in fact, I'm, I'm starting to already think about a version 2 of it that will be multi-band. There, there's enough pins on the Arduino that I could have it switching other relays to switch different low-pass filters. Or you could build low-pass filters into band modules that could plug onto the main board, you know, and then the Arduino could sense from three or four pins a binary number and automatically know which, which band to set the software for. You know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of possibilities. But as it's, as it's being spec'd here, it's a single band transmitter, but unlike the uh, rock bound crystal controlled little low power transmitters, this one can tune across a range of frequencies. Um, let's go look at the schematic, shall we? Okay, so from left to right, um, up there in the corner, obviously we've got a 7805 regulator to give us five volts for the chips. Um, that first diode D1 there is just a polarity protection diode. You can use any old big silicone diode for that. Um, you know, one of the beefier ones is probably better. The whole function of that polarity protection diode is to blow a fuse. So you should, with any 
piece of equipment that you're hooking up to a power source, you should have a fuse in line with the power line, right? <laughs> that, that's just a must have. And the idea behind that diode is if you plug it in backwards, the diode is a short, the fuse blows and your circuit is saved. So that's just polarity protection. Um, then uh, below that there, we've got the Arduino Nano. Now that's the uh, little microcontroller board. Uh, next to it is the SI5351, which you can buy on a breakout board from EtherKit or Adafruit. It's a common, widely available little breakout board. And that's the VFO. Uh, to the right of that, we have the 74LS244, which is an octal line driver chip that we're using as a power amplifier. And that's going to give us around 4 to 500 milliwatts of output power when all of those stages are paralleled like that. Uh, also coming out of the Arduino, we have a control line over to Q1, which is the relay driver. That's just a regular NPN switching transistor like a 2N222 or a, two, or a uh, 2N3904, just a, a bog standard common NPN switching transistor, nothing fancy. All it's doing is turning the relay on. Um, coming out of the 74LS244, there is T1. Now that's a coupling transformer. The output impedance of that chip is low, somewhere around 12 to 13 ohms. So we need a 4 to 1 transformer to match that up to 50 ohms for the uh, low pass filter and, and you know your feed line to your antenna. Uh, so that I have not finished yet. Uh, I'm winding one, or I'm working on winding one. And uh, the reason is, if we look at Zach Tech's um, whisper transmitter, he uses a pre-made part for the transformer there, MCL F3GB, it's a 12-613-1. Uh, that's widely available and you could use that for that coupling transformer if you want. However, um, as Harry told me, the cores in that thing are so tiny that they get saturated. And as a result, his whisper transmitter only puts out about 250 milliwatts instead of what the chip could actually produce. So I'm going to be winding a 4 to 1 transformer, and I'm looking at a couple of different ways to do that and experimenting with that right now. I think I have an idea on how to do that and get um, a better power transfer through so we get the power the chip's producing out to the output. So that's, uh, that's coming. If, if we go back to the... Uh, well, we'll look at the other schematic in a moment, but um, you could buy that part. It's available from Jameco or, or DigiKey or any of the other electronics suppliers and just use that in the circuit if you want. But you only get about a quarter of a watt out of it if you use that part. So if you want to build ahead, you know, if you, there's enough information published at this point that you could build this. The software is done. That was the big one. That's the big part of it. All that's uh, linked up, the software's up on GitHub. The blog has the schematic that you can download the image of. Uh, right there. So, you know, you could actually build this at this point. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if I get <laughs> an email from somebody in a few days with pictures of their built and working transmitter. So, who knows? Uh, but mine uh, mine will be down the road because I'm still waiting on parts. I, uh, <laughs> I thought I had all the capacitors that I would need for the low-pass filter, but going through my parts bin, I did not. So, uh Anyway, back to the schematic. Uh, then we've got the low-pass filter. Now we'll talk about that in more detail in just a moment. And finally, the relay. And that's just a little 5-volt, double-pole, double-throw relay. Um, I think I've got the Jameco part number on there. Yeah, part number 140290 through Jameco. Um, it's just a 5-volt, double-pole, double-throw relay. And uh, what it does is the transmit-receive switching. And if we look closely at the uh, wiring there, um, coming from the antenna in, when the relay is in its normally closed position, not engaged, that jumps across to the receiver output jack. So we pass the antenna right on through to your receiver. Um, there's that little gimmick wire there, by the way. As you can see, there's a wire coming from clock one out of the SI5351, and it's wrapped around the wire at the jack there. And that's for this, the tuning, the spot tuning. When you hit one of the tune buttons, the Arduino is going to turn on that second output from the clock generator at the current frequency and start moving the frequency 
If you hit the tune down button, it's going to move it down. If you hit the tune up button, it's going to move it up. And all you do is you just listen on your receiver until you hear your, your signal move past. And then you stop and you hit the other button and you bring it down to where its pitch is where you want it to be for your operating. You know, 700 hertz is, is a common pitch that people like to operate at. And by doing so, you're automatically offset from your receiver by that amount, which is how CW works. When, you're, when your radio is in CW mode, your receiver is offset from your transmitter by about 600 hertz. And the reason being, when you tune your receiver to the carrier of the station you're operating at, your receiver is zero beaded on him. No, you're, when you tune your radio to the, the station you're going to operate, your transmitter is zero beaded on him. If your receiver was lockstep on the same frequency, you wouldn't hear him. You know, the, you wouldn't hear anything except maybe the noise going away when he keyed down. So your receiver is offset by 600 hertz or 700 or 800 hertz. So when he transmits, you hear that pitch, you hear that 700 hertz tone. Your receiver and your transmitter are not exactly on the same frequency, right? So by tuning it with the tune buttons until you hear it at the right pitch, you've automatically created that offset of 700 or 800 hertz. And you can pitch match to a station you're going to call. If you hear somebody calling CQ, you just use those tune buttons to bring the pitch to match that guy. And you're tuned in. So that's how that spot tuning is going to work. Simplifies the transmitter. It doesn't need a calibrated dial you know, to, to try to get directly on a specific frequency. You're just putting it exactly where you want it to be. And ta-da! So, that's what that gimmick wire is. Now, when we go into transmit mode, that relay fires. And now, if we follow the antenna path down, it comes directly to the low-pass filter, which is where our transmitted signal is coming out of. And the software waits a couple of milliseconds for the relay to close before it turns on the, the uh, output. Uh, which you won't even notice. It's, it's so quick. Uh, on the receive side of the relay, when we go into transmit mode, it grounds the receiver antenna. And you would think that that would make your receiver just completely deaf, but no. Um, that protects your receiver from the RF that's being generated by the transmitter, but enough still gets through into the coax that the receiver can hear it. So you'll, your receiver will be your side tone when you're transmitting. You'll hear your own sending through the receiver. So that's basically how it works. That's, that's the schematic. Let's talk about the low pass filter. So this is the low pass filter schematic. Now it's a, it's a very basic low pass filter. Four capacitors, three inductors that you do have to wind on toroids, but they're easy. They're not that many turns really. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not hard at all. And all the details on those capacitors and those inductors is in this table below. So if we look at this table close up, you'll see we've got uh, values for pretty much every band from, um, from uh, low, the low frequency bands all the way up to uh, 4 meters or 70 megahertz. Some of these are European bands. So let's pick, for example, 20 meters, which is what I'm building mine for, right? And if we go across, we see that uh, C1 and C4 are going to be 180 picofarad caps. C2 and C3 are going to be 390 picofarad caps. And then we have the nano Henry values of the, uh, two, tor the uh, two toroids, or the three toroids. L1 and L3 are the same. L2 is a little different. The number of turns, in this case, 12 turns on L1 and L3. 13 turns on L2. Um, the length of wire that you need to cut to make those turns is already in the table here, which is really nice. And then we have the core type over here. Amidon Material 6 is the uh, specifier. Um, and these are for T50 toroids or half inch toroids. So there you go. All the details you need to wind the uh, toroids and the capacitor values for any of the bands. So whatever band you want to build it for, this table will give you that data. And this uh, schematic will be linked in the, I got to add it to the blog right up. This, this schematic and the table itself will be linked in the blog. I'll add those today. So by the time you see this, they'll be in there as well. And you can just download the images right there. 
Uh, so that's pretty simple. Um, obviously over here on the right, it says coupling transformer coming soon. I've got to finish my experiments with the two types of, of transformer I'm looking at, at using. I think I know which one I'm going to go with. Uh, hint, uh, spoiler, it's actually the same 4 to 1 transformer design I use um, for my antenna builds and I've talked about before. Uh, and I believe that it'll work fine because that's a broadband 4 to 1 transformer. Broadband being important because it has to cover, it has to couple well across the frequency range of the amateur bands that this can be built for. So I'll, I'll have details in that eventually once I get a working one that I'm satisfied with and we'll add that in. But as I said, if you want to build it now, you can go and order that little PC board or that little component transformer that, that I showed and gave the number of and use that. It's just that it's going to saturate and you'll be limited to about a quarter of a watt of output. But hey, you know, that might be enough for you. I don't know. So those are the schematics. Uh, what's next? Um, oh, the output section on the schematic. Uh, I think I mentioned you could just use that chip as a driver and uh, put like an IRF 510 power MOSFET in there. Um, there's all kinds of projects out there that use that as a, as a final amp that you could look at. So you could probably take it up to 4 or 5 watts if you wanted to. Uh, I'm not going to detail that. I'm just building this base design. Okay. The software. Let's go look at the software. So the important parts here to, to really point out is up here at the top where we declare variables that are used in the program. This is where you can, uh, you can change things to suit your build. If you're not using the Arduino Nano, um, if pin numbers are different for where, how you had to wire your control pins, the key input, the button input, or whatever, you can change those pin numbers here at the top where I defined them. I, I named each pin within the program, so like tune up is the tune up button input, and I wired that to pin 2. The key pin is the uh, key input where our, our Morse key is going to ground it, and I wired that to pin 7. So you could actually change these numbers if you're using a different chip and, the, the, and, and you're using different data pins. Uh, for your inputs. Um, and within the code, that makes it more readable. When you see the word key pin in the code, you know I'm talking about the input pin for the Morse key and so on. So I did that for two reasons. You can change it and you can read it in the code. Tune count and tune step, um, those you don't really want to mess with. Uh, they might change. That has to do with fine tuning how soon the speed changes. When you hit the tune button, it initially starts moving the frequency slower and after half a second moves it faster. And that allows you to fine tune it by tapping the buttons and holding the button for half a second allows you to move faster if you're tuning across the band to find your, your signal on your receiver. Um, tuning, tune VFO, these are flags that I use within the program. Uh, for tracking things as the program loops through. You can ignore those. Uh, the important things down are down here at the bottom. Freak, band bottom, and band top. Uh, freak is the startup frequency that it's going to be set to when you power it up. In my case, I'm on 20 meters, so I've got it at 14.03 um, megahertz. And this value is in hundredths of a hertz. So if you write out the frequency, like 7 million for 7 megahertz, add two more zeros at the end, because this is in hundredths of a hertz. If you're building this for a different band, like 40 meters, you could change these values here um, to a startup frequency wherever you want it in the 40 meter CW portion. You would probably set band bottom to be uh, 7 million with two extra zeros, and band top I set the band top right where the digital section starts, you know, but you could set it to whatever range you want to operate in. The bigger you make that, potentially the longer you'll have to wait when you hold down one of the tune buttons before you hear your signal move past your receiver, you know, so you probably don't want to make it too big. And reasonably, you really only want the CW portion of the band because that's the mode we're operating in. So those are the three variables that are, that are most important in this. Whatever band you're building it for, that's where you tell the software 
what frequency to start with and the range of frequency to operate within. And that's that. Uh, moving down, uh, void setup. This is just setting things up, uh, setting the uh, I.O. pins and putting them into an initial state, setting up the uh, SI5351 and turning its outputs off. And then we have the interrupt routine. So this interrupt routine here, which I'm highlighting, this is for timing. Um, this is just a little routine that runs a thousand times a second. It's, it's a CPU interrupt, which means that it, it happens reliably 1,000 times a second. No matter what the CPU is doing, 1,000 times a second, it will drop what it's doing and run this code. And I use this for timing. I need an accurate way to measure time uh, without doing any math, really. And so what I do is I have this interrupt routine down here that looks at a couple of variables that I use as timers and it counts them down. It subtracts one from them. So, for example, tail is the keying tail. When you release the key, uh, it's the delay before it switches back into receive mode. This is not a QSK transmitter. You could try and run it that way, but that relay would be chattering with each dot and dash, and uh, I don't know, that would bother me. And I don't know, I'm sure it will be safe for the receiver, but um, it just makes me nervous switching it back and forth constantly and putting power out every other click. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's the tail. And uh, I set that, I, I control that with a variable that I set for, uh, I forget what I set it for. I think I set it for a second. Um, but you could actually reduce that if we go back up here to the variable section. Tail default right here. Yeah, 1000. That's one second because that routine runs a thousand times a second. And so I know that if I set that tail default variable at a thousand, one second later it will be zero because it will have counted down through this interrupt routine, you see. And then tune count, uh, the default is uh, 500, I think, for half a second, which is the delay between when it switches between slow and fast speed when you're tuning. Uh, so you don't, ch don't change anything in any of these. <laughs> That's, that interrupt routine is important for timing, so don't mess with that. And then we've got the main program loop. And this is the part of the program that just runs continuously over and over and over again. And I have commented everything here um, as thoroughly as I could so you can read through it and understand what's happening. You know, for example, this first section here reads the state of all the hardware inputs to see if the buttons are pressed. One note, and I'm probably going to rewrite the code. Um, because of the way the Arduino works, and since we're grounding the pins when we enable the switch, like push the key down or push one of the buttons, we're grounding that pin, it's switching from a 1 to a 0. So it's kind of reversed, logically. Um, you would think turning the key on would be on, would be true, or a 1, but it's actually a 0. So the logic when you're reading through the program can kind of mess with your head, and I had to kind of think backwards, you know, zero is on, one is off for the buttons, and that, that's, you know, throughout the program. Uh, there was an obvious thing pointed out to me by a programmer friend that I could just not, I, I could just put an exclamation point in here, like right before where I read it, and that means not. So that reverses it, <laughs> which <laughs> then I could write the rest of the code in a logical sense. I will probably rewrite it, but that will change on GitHub. This code is up on GitHub. It works. You can use it as is. Um, if I make any changes to it, it will always work. I will not put code up on GitHub that's, that, that has a major problem. Um, I, I'll put it up there when it's been tested and I know it works. So in the future, Watch the version number. If uh, the version number has changed at the top and you want to update yours, you can download the new code. So then the rest of it is just, uh, well, it's, it's like I say, it's commented. You can read through it at your leisure and, and try to make sense of it, but it's, um, uh, it flowed out of my brain, so it makes sense to me. <laughs> I don't know if it'll make sense to you. Uh, but it's basically broken down into a couple of major sections. We got the keying section first. This manages turning the VFO and the relay on and off as uh, as needed when we're keying the key. And this loop runs continuously. You know, th this is not like basic programming on a, on a linear machine like an old Commodore 64 where things happen one step after another until the program is done. 
um, this is like one big continuous loop so you have to use flags to keep track of the state of things in that because it, it, during the time that I have pressed the key down and the, the thing has gone into transmit this loop might have run another 1200 times or more you know it's very fast so the first section is keying and that's that's all the logic involved with managing the VFOs and turning the uh, uh, relay, transmit, receive relay on and off and turning on the uh, VFO to, tr to transmit, turning it off to, to stop transmitting. The next section down is the tuning logic. And um, this is, uh, I'm sure there's a better way to do all of this. As I said, I'm not a programmer, but uh, this is basically a bunch of decisions to make as it goes through the program and then that last little bit down there is uh, when the buttons are, have been released, what we go through before we turn off the spot tuning signal. So it's, it's pretty basic. Basic. It's pretty simple. Um, and as I said, commented throughout. So that's the software. I think that's it. I think that's all I wanted to talk about in this one. So that's, you know, that's where the project's at. Um, as I said, there's probably enough information there now that you could build it as is. I'm still working on my prototype. Um, I'm not going to have the rest of my capacitors and parts in until uh, the end of next week. So I'm going to do, I need to take a little break from this project anyway for a few days. It's been kind of, you know, saturating my brain. So I'm going to do something different this week for the next video. And uh, part three will be a working unit. Uh, making contacts, getting on the air. Uh, final uh, notes that I, whatever I changed as I worked my way through it. Uh, so that's that. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.